Now, the Cold War impacted the United States internally and domestically more than it impacted the Soviet Union uh, domestically. Um, and that's because we had freedom. We had freedom of thought, freedom of speech, etc. So people uh, communicated their ideas. It was much easier to be a communist in the United States, for example, than it was to be a capitalist in the Soviet Union. Well, that would begin to change. We see the rise of anti-communism. We have HUAC in the United States, which is the House, House Un-American Activities Committee. Um, this, again, is abetted by the Korean War. <clears throat> this had raised issues. Again, this creates some, some concern. Um, and again, it's only exacerbated then when Sputnik is sent into space and the Soviets have beat us there. We have what's called the Hollywood Tent. Now, HUAC, the, again, the House Un-American Activities Committee, went after Hollywood. It got studio heads to name names of communists, communists, even without evidence. Nineteen are named and interrogated by HUAC. This is where we get the famous question, are you now or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? Ten of these Hollywood folks would cite the First Amendment as a prohibition on HUAC's right to even ask the question. They would be held in contempt and jailed for a year. They were soon blacklisted. But there was protest. 500 of the creative community signed on to, quote, the Committee for the First Amendment because they deemed these trials as, quote, disloyal to the spirit and letter of our Constitution. They also formed a radio campaign, Hollywood Fights Back. They didn't necessarily defend the 10, but they stood on principle. Included in this group, Humphrey Bogart, Lauren Bacall, Ira Gershwin, John Houston, Jane Wyatt, Gregory Peck, James Stewart. Rita Hayworth, Frank Sinatra, Spencer Tracy, and Katherine Hepburn. But still hundreds of artists were blackmailed for years. Some spent time in jail for contempt. And Hollywood would in many ways only get behind the anti-communist sentiment. Uh, they would promote anti-communist films, uh, <clears throat> TV shows, uh, snippets at the movies. All kinds of anti-communism dominated American culture, especially popular culture, which we won't really get into, but it is something worth uh, worth looking up Stephen Whitfield, I believe, is the one who wrote the book The Culture of the Cold War. A very impressive work details how much anti-communist hysteria dominated public popular culture. Not just film, not just TV, but comic books, any magazine you could find. So something to look at. So now what do we associate with this anti-communist activity in the United States? Joseph McCarthy and McCarthyism. How did this all start? February 9th, 1950, he goes to give a speech in Wheeling, West Virginia. He has two speeches from which to choose. He must choose either talking about the housing issue or communists in the government. He decided to allow local, a local Republican leader um, who had picked him up at the airport to decide. In this speech, of course, he would choose the anti-communist speech. I cannot take the time to name all the men in the State Department who have been named as active members of the Communist Party and members of a spy ring. I have here in my hand a list of 205, a list of names that were made known to the Secretary of State as being members of the Communist Party and who nevertheless are still working and shaping policy in the State Department. Now, there were no names. There was no proof of communism. What he had was a four-year-old letter from Secretary of State James Burns that said 3,000, or that of 3,000 people who had been screened at state for communism, 285 had simply not been recommended for permanent employment, and 79 had been separated from the service altogether. When later asked for the letter, McCarthy, in classic McCarthy form, claimed he left the list in a suit that was still on the plane, so he couldn't look at it. So again, he says that he has a list of 205 names that are known to the Secretary of State as being members of the Communist Party. All these 205 people were, were just people who had not been recommended for permanent employment. Mm. But again, he would make his work happen here. Later, he would claim he had the names of 57, quote, card-carrying members of the Communist Party. Now, this was from a report by ex-FBI agent Robert Lee, who examined state loyalty files um, and put question marks against 57 men. More than half had been cleared. 22 were still under review. But again, McCarthy publicizes this as 57 card-carrying members of the Communist Party. Absolutely ridiculous. Absurd. Um, now, he had his nicknames. Smile and Joe. He's always smiling. If you see any picture of Joseph McCarthy... First of all, he's the weasel in the picture. If you look, you can tell who, who McCarthy is. He always smiled, called Smiling Joe. He was also called the Ten Cent Robespierre. 
Now, if you're familiar with the French Revolution, the guillotine, the reign of terror, the Committee for Public Safety, you're well aware of Robespierre, and you generally don't want to be associated with Robespierre. But who was McCarthy? He was a self-made man. He had become a judge at the age of 31, and he was the youngest United States senator by the age of 38. That is impressive. But he had been censured for destroying evidence uh, when an attorney had forged, um, he had been, I'm sorry, he had been censured for destroying evidence. He had forged a document declaring that he had been wounded as a tail gunner in the Pacific, ergo his nickname Tail Gunner Joe. He cozied up with special interests while a senator and was not really that popular in Wisconsin. Now, remember, Wisconsin is a progressive state. They're the progressive party. Um, they are, in general, now and always have been a pretty liberal state. But McCarthy is a Republican. He would instill fear in Truman and Eisenhower. He instilled fear in academics. He turned friend against friend. He ruined the careers of many and led millions to suspicion of others. From family members to neighbors, he was against communism, so anyone who criticized him must be in favor of communism. Now, why did McCarthyism even take hold? We have the atomic bomb, right? Beginning of the Cold War with that. We have communist China. Truman lost China. So the Americans allowed China to go to communism. It had nothing to do with the, commun or the Chinese themselves, right? We had the Korea issue. We had the spy Alger Hiss. We had Soviet expansionist imperialism. There was great national anxiety, and this brought people together in, in a kind of a negative form, obviously, but it did bring people together. Now, we have the McCarran Internal Security Act comes up during this time. The Immigration Act opened up quotas for those from Asia, but also it more strenuously screened potential immigrants. Anyone who was declared a subversive, a subversive by the Attorney General was simply denied entry into the United States. And members of communist and communist front organizations were subject to deportation. So as I mentioned, you could be a communist in the United States, well, up until this time. If you were found to be a communist, you were subject to deportation. Senator McCarran's quote, If this oasis of this world, if this oasis of the world should be overrun, perverted, contaminated, or destroyed, then the last flickering light of humanity will be extinguished. Hyperbole much. Truman would veto this, but Congress overrode his veto, again showing the virulent anti-communism of the time. Was it politically motivated? McCarthy was up for re-election. He needed something to differentiate himself from other potential candidates for his Senate seat. With friend Edmund Walsh, Walsh McCarthy decided to play on the nation's anti-communist hysteria. Um, now, on February 9, 1950, he publicized his list of over 200 State Department employees who were subjects, or who he argued were members of the Communist Party. He held hearings to embarrass and humiliate witnesses. He doctored pictures and released them to make them look like his personal and political enemies were in, no, in cahoots with known communists. Now, for example, Senator Millard T Tidings, uh, who had led an investigation debunking McCarthy, was included in a composite picture with communist leader Earl Browder with the caption, Oh, thank you, sir. This would be published in the media, and it would help defeat tidings in the 1952 election. Um, but significantly, he had never met with him. Uh, and you can, uh, these days in Photoshop era, we can see that the, the photo is obviously doctored. Uh, but again, it just goes to show what McCarthy was willing to do to take down his enemies. Now, what deemed someone a danger? It turns out the FBI maintained files on anyone who they believed could be a danger, which was essentially anyone who showed public support or criticism uh, of a social concern, or the FBI. Authors, Sinclair Lewis, William Faulkner, they were uh, put on this list for their stand on civil rights. Hemingway was for his support of the Spanish Republicans during the Civil War. Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath was declared un-American. Theodore Dreiser uh, was put on this list. Poets Robert Frost, E.B. White, Carl Sandburg. Uh, these are all people that we consider great American authors. Um, but again, they are considered suspicious. One person was accused of uh, close association with his brother. Um, what that meant was he had actually attended a rally at Yankee Stadium at which Paul Robeson spoke. So... Um, economist and liberal John Kenneth Galbraith <laughs> was watched. Um, one informant called him doctrinaire uh, to describe his political views. Now, those in charge misheard this as Dr. Ware. So Galbraith was deemed a follower of a sinister, sinister subversive named Dr. Ware. 
even though there was no such person. He was just described as Dr. Nair. So again, this shows the absurdity. Um, it, it's just the laughability of much of the anti-communist hysteria. If you've ever seen the movie The Way We Were, that does portray some of this. It's an excellent movie. But basically, anyone who was an activist or had an activist background was deemed a danger. Now, where was Eisenhower? He refused to repudiate McCarthy because that would only give him the publicity he wanted. At least that's what Eisenhower claimed. I refuse to get down in the gutter with that guy, he said. But he also had approved civil appointments of folks who turned out to be communist. Accused communists. Now, how did all this end? Roy Cohn, uh, who was McCarthy's assistant, tried to prevent a friend from being drafted, but the army refused. They turned on the army, McCarthy and his cadre, return, they would turn on the army, accusing the army of coddling communists, and claim there was a spy ring at Army Signal Corps at Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. They went so far as to go after a frail, middle-aged cafeteria worker, and questioned her and tried to blame her. The Army released a report on Cohn's effort to protect his friend, David Shine, and a Republican senator from Vermont, Ralph Flanders, denounced him on the floor of the Senate. Edward R. Edward R. Murrow attacked him on the evening news as well, using McCarthy's own words against him. Now, Murrow was the voice of authority for many Americans. He was the leading journalist at the time, back when journalism was actually a thing, when there was objectivity, when there was a search for truth, Murrow was behind it. Um, there is actually a movie about Murrow that's out there um, worth looking at. Now, one thing I, just, I do want to include about Cone, um, Cone was a homosexual, but he was in the closet at this time. And he would later be uh, involved in the civil rights movement. Um, he, was a, he was a very good attorney, uh, did a lot of good work. Um, but because of his homosexuality, he was marginalized. And even after doing great work in the 60s, he would be pretty much cut off from everybody because he was homosexual. The inference here is that David Shine was his partner at the time. Who knows if that's true? But again, he tried to get Shine to not have to, um, to prevent his drafting. Um, <clears throat> so again, this leads to the backlash. The Army McCarthy hearings were held for 36 days. McCarthy refused to budge. Even though Cohn had come to an understanding with Army Counsel Joseph Welch and tried, to, and tried instead to smear one of Welch's young assistants, Welch's famous rebuke, rebuke, Let us not assassinate this lad further, Senator. You have done enough. Have you no sense of decency, sir? At long last, have you no sense of decency? Now, this is the popular refrain. This is kind of what ended McCarthy when people kind of woke up and said, Wow. He's not decent. He shows no decency. Welch would later say to McCarthy, I like to think that I'm a gentle man, but your forgiveness will have to come from someone other than me. The Senate voted 67 to 22 to condemn McCarthy for, quote, conduct contrary to the senatorial traditions. And that was it. He would die of acute alcoholism only a few years later. McCarthy had a lot of issues, a lot of personal demons, and one can't help but think that this is what spurred on his activity. Obviously, many times when people are insecure, they attack people. They're, they might be violent, they're nasty, uh, but it's only because they don't feel good about themselves, and one must conclude that this is how McCarthy felt, and that's why he went after so many people. So, again, it was corruption, essentially, that brought McCarthy down. It wasn't about his tactics, his lack of proof, his false assertions, his false accusations. It was a personal issue, one that focused on his assistant to boot. But it brought him down. One interesting note, again, Cohn was McCarthy's chief counsel, a job that Robert Kennedy wanted. Kennedy would later disgrace Cohn. I mentioned that a little bit ago. Um, and Cohn would argue that this was out of spite for getting the job under McCarthy instead of Kennedy getting it. Now, whether this is true or not, who knows, but Kennedy was a cold warrior. He wanted to work under McCarthy. Um, Nixon was part of HUAC, so many popular or unpopular American leaders were part of this anti-communist hysteria. Some of them did work under McCarthy. Roy Cohn, C-O-H-N, is worth studying on your own. Um, a fascinating character in American history, uh, one who really, how shall we say, was just born at the wrong time. Now, we'll leave it at that. We'll come back. We'll have another video about Cuba.